Adam Casera is the founder of Leader at Large. With over two decades of experience in the telecom and media industry, including leadership roles at Dish Network and Sling TV, Adam has now transitioned into a consultancy role. He leverages his extensive background in sales, marketing, and AI to help small and large businesses navigate the complexities of growth and operational efficiency. Tune in as Adam shares his invaluable insights on overcoming the challenges small businesses face in today's noisy environment, the importance of personal branding, and the critical need for building robust operational processes early on. This episode is packed with actionable advice for entrepreneurs and business leaders looking to scale effectively and sustainably. As always, if you find value from this content, please like and subscribe. And now here's my interview with Adam Casera. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Beyond Fulfillment podcast. I am your host, Dave Goulas, and this week, my guest is the founder of Leader at Large, Adam Kuchera. Welcome, Adam. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, if you would, for everyone, can you just give us a, a quick summary of your background and, and up through what, what you're doing today with Leader at Large? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I spent about 21 years in the telecom media industry with Dish Network and Sling TV. I think most people, uh, especially in the U.S., are, are very familiar with uh, with those brands uh, and uh, had a number of roles uh, and leadership roles within the organization uh, on both the sales side uh, and marketing side, as well as on the RevOps and enablement uh, component. That's something where I have a, a huge passion for. Uh, I had a, had a fantastic team uh that, uh, that ran uh, RevOps and sales uh, training and, and enablement there uh, at Dish Network. And then uh, the last few years I've spent actually in AI, I, I pivoted and, and spent, you know, there was obviously a lot going on with AI over the last uh, few years. And so I was able to jump into that primarily in conversational AI, uh, but really got a chance to just get my hands very deep into um, into the AI and where AI is going, uh, and kind of a kind of mash those things together, uh, and then recently uh, I've kind of gone out on my own uh, and working with uh, with a number of different companies from a consultative role with Leader at Large, uh, and uh, a lot of those are smaller companies, um, but uh, also just compiling some things together to to work with some larger companies as well. Okay. Yeah, and you've you've had uh, quite a corporate career, like you said, with with Dish Network and Sling, some some bigger companies in the telecom yeah. space. Yeah. Um, with Leader at Large specifically, like what's what's the focus of the company that that you're work the companies you're working with? What's your focus for them? Yeah, it's there's been a, a handful of things, you know, uh, certainly on the sales and marketing, kind of helping to you know some smaller companies that need a little bit of where do I go from here? How do I grow? How do I take it from you know kind of the you know, the one man or the smaller operations to kind of the next level. Um, so I, I do that a little bit more holistic consulting. Uh, but I'm also, uh, you know, one of the companies that I'm working with is is kind of in a potential round of, of, of getting investment, some significant investment that would take, uh, take them into a manufacturing state um, and really completely uh, growing the company in that way. So um, part of what I've done in the past is working on the manufacturing side as well um you know, overseas and as well as in the US and putting those things together so uh diving in deep to help them kind of get ready for uh to, you know to to get that that funding and and move things forward okay and so <clears throat> you know coming from a corporate background with some some enterprise size companies and now like consulting and helping to grow small businesses what do you see some of the biggest um uh, like in regards to sales and marketing obstacles that these smaller companies are having? Well, I mean, first off, you know, in our our environment, our world today, it's a very noisy uh, environment, right? If you want to look for a, um, a marketing company, right? And you want somebody that's going to help you with uh, branded merchandise. We're all going to go to the internet first. We're all going to go and Google that and find out what's out there. We're going to do our own research. We may secondarily talk to some people that we that we know and see if they have any recommendations and then if they make a recommendation we're going to research that so having the ability to stand out in that noisy online 
um, world and, 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 and show why you're different uh, beyond just maybe price and et cetera, but why you're different and why somebody should choose you is, is hypercritical. And I think that that is an area where as a, as a smaller company, oftentimes they don't do the research or they don't look at the entire landscape to see where do they fit in, where can they differentiate themselves uh, and then stand out in all of the, whether it's social, whether it's, um, you know, just a strict online presence, um, you know, in, in getting their their own brand recognition uh, increased uh, across the across the world or across the country, depending on their their scope. Yeah, and clearly, right, like uh, we talked a little bit about personal branding, too, before this started, and that's something you've been very big on with your blog and some of the other stuff you're doing. Yep. I mean, how important do you think today is, like, is it for a small business owner to have their own brand, uh, their personal brand, to stand out and, and attract attention? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's absolutely critical that they they do that. And part of personal brand is also networking, Dave. Right. So it's not just go out and I put up a blog or I put up posts on Instagram and magically things happen. Right. You have to have people that are actually paying attention to you. And those people don't necessarily have to be current or or future customers. They could be people that you uh, know locally. Right. They could be in a completely different industry. Um, but being out there networking, online networking, face to face networking, there's shockingly a lot of local events where small groups will get together. Um, and and have a conversation, uh, get to know each other, make introductions, and, and be able to connect people. And to me, that's that's extremely uh, significant when it comes to personal brand because then you become that person that people either reference and say, "Oh, I need I need this thing." You know who you should talk to? You should talk to Dave. Dave is the guy. He knows so much. And now I'm introducing people to you that you would never have been able to connect with. So, and part of that is, is the, the, you know, the social uh, brand as well. So it's kind of a, a number of different factors, Dave, in my mind. Um, but when you can do that, now you're, you're, you're taking your own brand and who you are, you're putting it in, you know, across uh, a lot of different entities, including people, and those can really pay off uh, in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so what you mentioned the face to face networking and then the calls. I mean, any other ways that you could recommend to like entrepreneurs in terms of to be able to get out there and, and meet more people to to help, uh, you know, publicize their business? Yeah, I, I think that's flipping it around. Right. If, if you're hoping that people that you connect to will make references for you and will help you and give you thoughts and insights, do that for other people. I'm a big believer, you know, in paying it forward, right? I try to help people find, you know, roles and jobs at, at their companies. I try to help people with their companies, even if it's not an official consultation, if you will, right? I'm always trying to help people solve problems. Um, I'm willing to, you know, to, to to do those types of things because I just like to do it in the first place, right? And if I can help somebody grow themselves, grow their business, then they can turn around and make a, you know, and help me uh, down the road. And um, I think, so I think it's both, both directions. And I think a lot of people forget about that, right? It's, hey, how many people can I get to, uh, to read my blog or to do those types of things on the outside? But if you're not reading other people's blogs and commenting and forwarding and sharing and, and looking for those opportunities to say, hey, you know who you should meet, you know, and, and trying to think about those things, um, in my mind, if you're able to do that, then it will kind of beget people doing that for you as well and help you grow your business and your brand. Okay. And with your, uh, with your corporate career, like you said, you had a big, uh, like specialty and you have a passion for rev ops. So how, how do you see like that, that type of experience and what you did with dish network kind of applying that to, to helping small businesses grow? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I what I what I hear a lot is that small businesses think, okay, right now I've just got to go and, and and grow. I've got to do these things, um, you know, just the kind of the the raw um tasks, if you will, of growing their business. I'll worry about the operations and the systems and the processes later. I'll figure that out later when I'm bigger. When I've got 10 people or 20 people or 50 people, I'll worry about it then. And in my mind, that's when it's too late. And you can burn a lot of gas 
just uh, in idle or, or, you know, throughout that process, if you don't start to do that early on. And so I'm a massive believer in really drilling down early in that process, especially when you have a little bit of that extra time, so to speak, when you say, I, if I want uh, something to happen, what are the, not just four steps that are going to help make that happen. What are the 50 steps or maybe that's too many, but 20 steps that are going to help make that happen. So I can understand each of those steps so that when I see, have success, I can validate those 20 steps to make sure I'm optimizing. Or if I have failure, I can go back and maybe identify which steps were the point of failure and make those corrections. And if you're able to do that early, then you have the opportunity to grow a lot faster. And when you go from three employees to five or 10 employees, all of a sudden it gets fair. You, you, that's when you start to realize that you need it and start things start to break. And sometimes that's it's a lot harder to undo process and undo those things um, the, the, the faster you get or the more you grow. So in my mind, really op, uh, getting that operational excellence early on and identifying those things early on is, is hyper critical uh, to be able to scale very quickly, which we, we hope everybody does. Attention manufacturers and e-commerce sellers. Is fulfillment a headache for you? Whether you're fulfilling in-house and you know you need to outsource, or you're with another 3PL and you know you deserve better service, Easy DC 3PL can help. We offer personal service, fast response time, and we're flexible to meet your unique needs. Get in touch today and find out how we can help you. Yeah, and with, with the people you work with, do you see like resistance to that, or they totally like, or do they buy in? Right, like what? What's the reaction when you yeah, put that it, out on the field? Well, what's funny, David, and the reason I'm smiling is I actually see it. I've seen it on the large enterprise side. And I've seen the exact thing on very small business side. And that is, well, why do we need to do that? I don't understand. You know, I, I had a, uh, I was working with a, you know, a company recently and I was breaking down every element of the item that they needed to have manufactured. And not just unit A is, is $100. It was, okay, unit A is made up of these 30 elements and components. Let's understand how much each of those components are going to cost and where does that come from so that when we go and try to get a manufacturer to build this, that we know where that money is coming from and where we need to either tweak up or tweak down and ask those questions so that we can get the right price, but also understand that if we say well, we want you know, a better you know, rubber or a better packaging we know that that's X amount of the overall cost. And so understanding those details to me is extremely critical and important in the process so that you understand it. And the pushback that I got from uh, the founder was, why, I don't understand, why do we need all this information? Don't, we just need to know how much it's gonna cost. It's like, if you, if you don't understand all these elements, then you're going to possibly miss something and find out down the road, oh, well, you never asked for component, you know, X and that's going to be an extra $20 now. And you're like, wait a minute, you said it was going to be. So it, to me, the more that you understand it, the more that you can break it down, um, even if it's just as a reference, to me, that is that is super critical. But to answer your question, I think what I get, you, why do we need all that? Let's just go. Let's just go. <laughs> it's like, I understand. I want to go too. But if we go too fast and we don't understand these things, we are going to run into a problem later. Um, and when we do, it's going to cost twice as much. It's going to slow us down twice as much, if not more. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it brings up another point too, right? Because you're describing kind of that, that entrepreneur that just is kind of ready, fire, aim, right? <laughs> yep. And, uh, and look, I can relate to that. I can relate to that mindset. But, you know, a lot of people find it's very important to balance that out with people that are operationally minded and maybe, yep. on a, you know, with a different personality type. How, how important do you see that in the companies that you work with? Uh, ab absolutely. And that's, that's, you know, whether, you know, you, ha you want different personalities, right? You want the ready, fire, aim person because, you know what, they are going to push everybody, you know, to, to really try as hard as possible to go. 
but you also have to have that person that's saying, understand, but if in order to do that, it's going to take this much time and we can do that. And you have to be able to balance in that push and that pull. And if you have that within your organization and everybody does have that opportunity to have that voice and, and, and that ready, fire, aim person is willing to say, okay, I understand. I want it in one week and you're telling me it's six weeks. How do we get it to four, right? Let's work. Let's, let's meet in the middle, right? And, and everybody works together, you know, in that way. So I think it is important to find that. Um, and oftentimes it's pulling that person that's outside of the, the inner circle, right? Especially when it comes to, um, you know, a, uh, an entrepreneur or a small business, right? You're surrounding yourself with the, the people that you know, right? You and a, a friend or, um, you know, uh, a past coworker are starting the company and you brought in four people from that past company because you know that person and so on. And all of a sudden it can be an echo chamber, right? And you don't have that voice that has come from a different industry or from a different company or a different, you know, ideology when it comes to business that can challenge and say, oh, you know what, there's actually a way better way to do that. Or I have a, you know, have you ever thought about it doing it this way? Because, you know, this could be very helpful. And so I think bringing somebody in to that can be very, um, very critical to a business to have that different mindset uh, to bring into the the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> and speaking more about uh, leadership at large too. So I want to dig into to some of your blog posts because I, I was looking at that. So you did a, a lot of writing here too, just on different, it's like personal development topics and kind of stuff you've you've um, experienced throughout your career. I, one specifically too, where you talked about resilience, bouncing yeah. back can, your, can be your secret weapon. Yep. Can you just like expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. So I, you know, one of the core principles uh, that I've kind of built um, a lot of my enablement and, and my operational thinking around um, is something I call core, C-O-R-E, and it's commitment, ownership, resilience, and exploration. And so the resilience part of that is really that ability to bounce back from setbacks and challenges um, and really understanding those obstacles and the roadblocks, but being able to overcome those, right? And, and, and when it, to me, the biggest part of that resilience is, um, is understanding those obstacles, right? And, and not just powering through, if you will, but really digging in. When, when you trip and you fall, right? You don't just brush yourself off and go forward. Why did I fall? What, what happened? Like, let me understand that because if it's a, you know, if there was something in the road, I need to learn, I need to step around that in the future. And if you don't, if you just brush yourself off, you might fall again and again and again if you don't understand that. So you certainly have to have the resilience to say, hey, I'm going to overcome this when things are bad, when I have a deal that I thought was going to come through at the end of the quarter and it doesn't come through. Rather than say, well, we just have to try harder next month or next quarter or do more next quarter to make up. Well, let's look at what happened. Did we forecast wrong? Did we misunderstand something within our sales process of why that was going to close or we thought it was going to close? You know, how, what, what was the reason? Um, and, and if you understand that, it's less likely to happen down the road. And so that's where I think that from my perspective, that resilience component comes into, Dave, um, is really, again, yes, you have to pick yourself up and you have to dust yourself off when things go bad. But if you don't understand why it went bad, you're just going to keep making that same mistake. Do you see that too as another challenge, to, you know, talking about like the entrepreneurs that just want to go, right? In terms of like they have the the bounce back mentality and they're resilient where they'll just get up and, and keep trying harder. But you you like sounds like you're saying an important part of resilience is to step back and analyze exactly what happened so you don't make those same mistakes again. Yeah, for for sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, the risk, right, is that for an entrepreneur, you don't have as many times to do that. Right. In, in a small business, you know, you're getting started. You have a certain amount of money that you've gotten either from your own yourself or from uh, from investors. You may only be able to trip and fall, to take my analogy further, three or four times before you're done. You you don't have the ability to get back up again because you're out of money. You've you've lost too much. Right. You can't go forward. Um, and so that's why, you know, a, a larger enterprise. Right. 
heck, they're tripping and falling, you know, 20 times a day uh, because there's just so many things going on and they they can absorb a lot more of that uh, in general. But yeah, you know, for a smaller uh, entrepreneur, that's why, again, I go back to what I said before of you have to understand those things, you know, and, and build out those processes and understand the process because when you do trip and fall as an entrepreneur, you have to identify what happened and fix it so that it doesn't happen again because you don't have as many opportunities to fail as you do uh, potentially in a, in a much larger organization, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and so with, uh, you know, we're midway through 2024 right now, right. And you've got the, um, the leadership at large and then the consulting going, what, like, what's, what's next for you, like the rest of the year with, with your company and what you're doing? Yeah. I mean, I continue to a couple of things, I, you know, continue to look at companies or work with companies to, to kind of help them develop and grow. You know, I think we all see that the, the landscape for, for companies is very challenging right now. Um, a lot, especially early to mid part of the or second, um, you know, first part of the year, um, panicked a little bit, kind of made adjustments. There was a lot of um, changes in, um, you know, in staffing and projects were canceled and so on because there was kind of this fear of, you know, things are slowing down. Um, and I think that a lot of rash decisions were made. And when those are made, it can help in the short term, right? But it long term that project that you canceled is going to come back and bite you because somebody else maybe develops that same product before you can recover and try again and so really where my focus is is um you know again working with some of those smaller companies and then also working with uh or looking at larger companies that need someone that can come in and say how do we do this long term how do we adjust now for the not for the current but also long term put things in process like the right um you know operations like the right enablement programs leadership programs building bench strength long term so that when things start to improve and everybody starts to buy from each other again and sales overall from companies and um you know continue start to grow again that you're ready to react much quicker there will be a lot of companies i can guarantee you dave that when things start to improve and everybody starts to buy again and, and sales start to go up for a lot of companies, there will be companies that will struggle because they are going to be six to nine months behind the curve because they've eliminated parts of their, their company, they've reduced um, projects and so on, and they're going to try to restart those engines and they will, not, they will have quickly realize that it takes a long time to, um, to build those things back up. So um, yeah, so that's uh, what it looks like for me. All right. And if people want to get in touch with you and learn more about your consulting and, um, you know, get more info about your company, what, what's the best way they can get in touch with you? Yeah. Uh, leader at large.com. Uh, so pretty straightforward there. Um, and then, uh, my email, Adam at leader at large.com. Okay. And LinkedIn, of course. All right. And we'll link all that in the show notes for everyone. All awesome. right, Adam, thank you so much for being here and taking the time. We really appreciate it. And that that's all the time we have for now. We will see Thanks you next lot, time. Dave. Appreciate it.